Hi, and thank you for joining me for Fluent in Finance, Demystifying Investment Strategies. I'm Monique Madden. I'm the head of Financial Life Strategies at UPotential, and the mandate of UPotential is to help people realize their optimal life so that you can do your financial planning and proceed with confidence. People ask me, you know, why is it even necessary to invest? And I say to them, well, in truth, at some point your income will stop, but your expenses will not. This could be for a very desirable reason, such as retirement that you've been planning for for many years, or it could be by no fault of your own through illness, injury, or prolonged unemployment. So even though we will save during our lifetimes, it's nearly impossible to save enough to support ourselves for retirements that can last nearly as long as our years of work did. So we do need some mechanism, some involvement by a, an investment market to increase the value of what we've saved and what we intend to be living off of. How much should you invest? Well, if you're investing, you want to satisfy three goals. You want to make sure that there's enough invested so that whatever life throws at you, you can handle. If there's, like I said, those uh, undesirable situations in life, a prolonged unemployment, an illness, an injury, uh, some significant home repair that's required or a car accident and you need to replace the car, you need to have enough set aside so that you can withstand financial emergencies. Beyond that, you want to accumulate enough such that you can live the standard of living that you desire in retirement. For some, that's a retirement that looks very much like their current standard of living. Others want a more ambitious retirement, and others would be happy to live more simply. So there's no real calculation as to what everyone should invest for retirement. It's very based on each person's goal. And lastly, if this is important to you, you want to make sure that there's enough left over that you haven't used to leave a legacy to future generations through your estate. Now, this is a very interesting graph. I'm not going to get into too much of the specifics, but let's look at the trend here. This is a graph that's produced by the Census Canada in 2016, and it basically relates your the average income in Canada to certain age brackets. As you can see by the orange line, when we're young, we tend to earn less. It increases as our experience and the appetite for our talents increases to a peak that's sort of, let's say, called in our 50s and 60s. And then it starts to come down again as we retire and go to a more fixed income situation. What's important to recognize is that early on in our careers, we're probably earning much less than we're spending. We're borrowing against future earnings through things like mortgages and, and student loans. Then at some point, our expenses are lower than our earnings, or at least that's the ideal. And that's during our peak earning years when you know we're starting to accumulate wealth, we're earning at a better clip, and hopefully we're spending within our means. Then later in our careers again, as we retire, there's a concern that we may earn less than we want to spend, that desired standard of living I was referring to before. What's really key here is that as incomes increase and that threshold of the orange line exceeding the pink line, we have to save the difference. If we can figure out, and that's part of what I do, what the sustainable spending pattern can be for a household, then we know how much we can save and still enjoy a standard of living that we'd like to become accustomed to in retirement. So this is very, very poignant that, you know, there's an expense level we'd like to keep that doesn't necessarily correlate with our earnings at every age. So my ambition for our time together is fourfold. I'd really like to teach you a little bit about investing, what I call Investing 101, and I, I promise to be very, very gentle. I want to teach you a little bit about designing a portfolio that's right for you. Then the absolute key to investment success, which is rebalancing. I'm going to show you how to harness the strengths and the weaknesses in financial markets, and ultimately how to go ahead and partner for success with an advisor. 
Let's start from the very, very beginning. Investing is not a random event. I liken it to collecting an art collection or a valuable coin collection or something of that nature. Investing really involves selecting pieces that fit together for one larger collection that ultimately becomes more valuable. In investing, really, you're only re rewarded for two things. One, your ability to not touch the money for a period of time, so your commitment in an investment. And secondly, if you're willing to take some risks, knowing that you could lose some of your capital will actually enhance your investment return. A purely safe investment is never really going to generate much in the way of income. Now, contrast this with speculating. Speculating is what people do when, you know, they're bragging about a particular investment and, oh, you should get in on it, or, you know, what you hear on the golf course or amongst friends at tea. Don't listen to any of that nonsense. People invest, and those that attract big gains, you can be sure have, in, have suffered horrible losses at other points. Anytime you're seeking something like a quick return on your investment, that's more akin to gambling than it is to investing. So please set that out of your mind. That's not at all what we're going to be looking at here. We're going to be looking at choosing good pieces and keeping them so long as they continue to fit in within your collection. I wish I could tell you that there was a perfect investment that allowed you to keep your capital safe, pay you semi-annually or quarterly some sort of an income and would increase in value but there really isn't the best we can do is two out of three so just to go through some terms here capital preservation means protecting the money that you've invested against loss and really the only things that achieve that are things like GICs and bonds that will pay you back your original investment at a certain point Income is anything that generates dividends or interest. Interest is produced by bonds and GICs. Dividends are produced by uh, shares of different types. So this is investment income that's generated on different schedules, either quarterly or semi-annually, or in some cases monthly. And that's what you tend to be able to spend on a regular basis. Growth, on the other hand, is the actual increase in the share price. So uh, you might see uh, something that you purchase at $25 growing to $30. That's the capital appreciation or the growth in the investment. No one investment, as I said, has all three pieces. If you're looking to focus on capital preservation and income, you're going to be attracted to bonds and something called a preferred share, which I'll describe in a second. If you're looking for income and growth, you're going to be attracted to common shares. Those are the ones that you read about in the investment press. And if you want capital preservation and growth, you might be involved in something called a segregated fund. A segregated fund is not dissimilar to a mutual fund you might have heard of, which is a basket of investments, but they're produced specifically by insurance companies so that they can provide some <clears throat> capital preservation uh, aspects as well. Getting back to preferred shares, again, these are not the common shares you read about in the investment press. They act a little bit like bonds, but they pay out dividends, so they're kind of a hybrid. And they become very, very attractive uh, as we age. You, you find a lot of seniors who purchase preferred shares because they want a regular uh, dividend rate, but dividends are more tax effect effective than interest, so they prefer that to, let's say, straight GICs <clears throat> in terms of producing regular income. So which goal takes priority? Well, you, you really need to focus on the question, which is what is the money for? Are you able to withstand loss? Can you take any risk? If you can't, you can't play with anything that generates growth. You need to focus on things that protect your capital. So this, an example of this might be if you're planning to save for um, a down payment on a home. Well, 
that down payment needs to be of a predictable value when the home closes because you need to be able to pay that money over to your lawyers. You can't take risks that it's going to be worth less than you hope it will. So it, you really need to focus on what is your ability to withstand risk. What is the time frame before you need the funds? If you've got lots and lots of time, well, you can withstand a few market cycles without being concerned. If you need the money in the shorter term, well, you can't. Again, the money might be worth less than you need it to be at a certain point of time. And also, you want to look at your personal circumstances and decide how much you need these funds to grow. The last thing you want to be in is a circumstance where uh, you're nearing retirement and you're grossly underfunded and have to take a lot of risk to try to generate returns because then you could just as easily lose all that all that money or most of it when you need it most. So you really do need to look at all three criteria. This is a really interesting way to, to think about investing. It basically looks at a timeline through which you'll match the investment. Your short-term goals, you really can't take any risk at all. You have to stay in things like cash and high interest savings accounts. For medium term goals, so that might be a significant purchase, a car or a vacation property that you might do in a few years time. Again, you don't have a lot of time to take risks, but in your longer term goals, this is things that you accumulate over your whole lifetime for retirement, for wealth accumulation, or to pass on to a future generation. These are the investments that you can use and harness markets by participating in equities, which are stocks or mutual funds that hold them. Notice that's really the only place that equities have a place in investing because you do need to have the time to withstand market cycles, which tend to be, you know, every five to seven years. So equities, let's let's delve into what those are. Those are stocks and again, mutual funds that hold them. Again, in case you're not familiar with the term, a mutual fund is a basket of investments. So uh, you buy a unit of something that then holds a multitude of different things. The qualities of an equity that make them both attractive and unattractive is that you can really never tell from one day to the next what they're going to do, but with some reliability, you can tell over time what they will do. So their, um, their characteristics are a short-term volatility with a promise of long-term performance. Now, over time, they do tend to outperform, out of, outperform bonds, and that's really, really critical, as we'll see in a minute. Most important, equities are the only investments that will outpace inflation. Inflation, if you're a younger person, we tend to live longer than previous generations did. And even if you're nearing retirement now, there's a good chance that you're gonna outlive your parents, the previous generation to you. And then inflation really does rear its ugly head over time. So you need investments not dissimilar to pensions that are that keep pace with inflation. You need your investments to keep pace with inflation and equities are the only ones that will do that. So people will ask me, you know, if equities are so great, why would I hold anything else? Well, you need to because equities also tend to tumble. So the strategy is to diversify by asset class. Asset classes are the characteristics of segregating cash, fixed income, which is bonds and GICs, and then equities, which is stocks and mutual funds that hold them. If you hold stocks and bonds at the same time, one will show strength when the other one shows weakness. And as a result, your portfolio becomes more stable. And research has shown that if you can segregate by asset class and decide the asset mix that's appropriate for you and stick to it, that really is the key to long-term investing. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that in a future slide. So using diversification as a defensive strategy, if you recall what happened in 2008, the so-called Great Recession, equities took a horrible, horrible beating. So the Toronto Stock Exchange went down 40%. International markets went down to various degrees. If you held a portfolio that was 100% diversified but still only held equities, 
your portfolio in that year would have gone down 33%, which is a, a tremendous hit. On the other hand, if you had a balanced portfolio, let's say described as a 40% fixed income allocation and 60% equity allocation, your portfolio would have gone down 19%. I still wouldn't have been happy with a 19% decline, but that 14% protection, so my portfolio as a, as a balanced investor would have outperformed the pure equity allocation by 14%. That's 14 big percent in, in falling markets. In contrast, the following year when equities rebounded, yeah, sure, the equity markets looked great. They went up 35%. And that same balanced portfolio, in contrast, only went up 23%. So it lagged in the strong year. So you have to decide for yourself. If you're willing to withstand these wild highs and lows, minus 33 in some years and plus 35 in others, then yes, you can be a pure equity investor, but I'll tell you there are very few people in this that are described in this way. A more balanced investor is far more common, and those are the people who don't necessarily care if they hit it out of the park every time, but they also don't want to strike out. So you'll see that diversification by asset class really does make a more defensive and stable portfolio. When you're deciding the portfolio and you decide what kind of investor you are, you need to decide the proportions I described before of cash, fixed income, and equities. In a best case scenario, you should never invest beyond your risk tolerance. As I described before, if you get caught nearing retirement and having way, way, way too little money, then you may need to invest beyond the, your risk tolerance, and that's never a comfortable thing. You'd be surprised, in fact, how many wealthy clients never invest aggressively, because from their perspective, if they know they have enough, why would they take the risk? So that's pretty much an ideal. You might also find wealthy clients who, let's say, segregate a smaller account, um, a so-called fun money account. They'll take this proportion of money that they know is not going to affect their standard of living, and this is the money that they will play with in investment markets. And that's okay. That's you know not dissimilar than going to Casino Rama or, or Las Vegas, but it's treated as such. They know that this is not money that's going to affect their standard of living. It's the money that that you do need to rely upon uh, on a regular basis that you don't necessarily want to play with. So decide what kind of investor you are. And this is done through financial institu institutions by completing a know your client or KYC form. It'll discuss you know, what sort of investor confidence do you have or knowledge? Are you a novice investor? Can you be classified as having fair investment knowledge, good investment knowledge, or are you quite sophisticated? This investor knowledge classification will then dictate the types of investments that can be sold to you. And that's really important. You'll, they'll also ask you, what's the worst return you can tolerate? If you would be sick seeing your investment return go down 10% in a year, well, you, you're not going to be offered certain investments because, it, again, it's only with that risk of fluctuation that you get big returns. And they'll also ask you how much of your money you need in the shorter term, let's say within five years, so that they can have that amount available to you on demand. The KYC serves to protect both you and the financial institution. From the perspective of, of you, the consumer, it protects you by limiting the products that can be sold to you. If you are honest on the KYC process and you describe yourself as a conservative investor, the financial institution cannot or your financial advisor cannot sell you certain aggressive or scary investments or they need to um, provide you with an awful lot of education around it. Most financial institutions have a compliance department that will make sure <clears throat> that anything sold to you is is suitable for the kind of investor that you have been diagnosed as. Of course, the flip side is that it also protects the advisor and the financial institution because as consumers, if we lose money, we tend to be litigious. We want someone to blame. So the KYC then will be able to um, 
provide some information to the investment advisor when you come to them with an investment that you'd like to purchase based on something you heard from a friend or family member they can say well no this doesn't match your your um, your investment to risk tolerance and if you proceed to pressure them to purchase it again on the advice of someone else they will code it as unsolicited or they will force you to update the KYC. They want to remain compliant with the kind of investor that you've told them that you are. So it really does base, it, it, it protects both the uh, consumer and the financial advisor. When designing a portfolio, you then if you're looking at asset allocations, you can see here that a conservative investor is more prone to purchase cash and bonds, fixed income type instruments. As you go through moderate, moderate growth, moderate aggressive investors to fully aggressive investors, they practically have no cash or bond um, positions at all. In fact, they may have more glitzy or sexy pieces like those specialty or hedge fund holdings on the far right hand side. It's interesting to note that a conservative investor will still have an equity component and you'll say well why would that be? It doesn't sound like it's consistent with the way that the client has described themselves but in fact you still need to have a small proportion of your portfolio in equities because equities are the only investments that will keep pace with inflation so I encourage even a conservative investor to have a small but still existent equity piece and there are ways even to select more conservative equities than others in contrast, those highly aggressive investors who are participating in hedge funds and things like that, they actually have to satisfy something called the accredited, accredited investor exemption. They have to show certain knowledge and risk tolerance before those investments can even be offered to them. So you can see how on both sides of the range, from the very, very conservative to the very, very aggressive, there are still controls to be had. So let's grow as an investor. Let's talk about you know, when it's appropriate to start investing in individual bonds and stocks. I usually recommend that people start a portfolio in mutual funds. The reason for that is, of course, when you're just starting out and investing, you don't have oodles and oodles of cash to invest. And it's nearly impossible for you then to get the diversification that you need to withstand market cycles. If you have only ten or $20,000 to invest and you're buying one or two investments, it's very hard for you to diversify. So buying a mutual fund, which again is a basket of investments, allows you to buy one unit that then represents a mix of cash, fixed income, and equities. So instant diversification at smaller price points. At some point though, because mutual funds are costly, those management expense ratios we'll talk about in a second, they're costly, so you want to outgrow them at some point. And I would think the time to outgrow them is when the portfolio size is nearing or exceeds about $100,000. At that point, if you were to buy 10 investments for $10,000 each, you could get a nice diversification. Anything less than that, and even if your money doubles in one investment, you know, you really haven't done much to the portfolio. In, in addition to just the pure size of the portfolio, I would want clients to have observed a market cycle or two, an ebb and flow, and see that, you know, 2008s do happen, but then 2009s also happen. So when markets get devastated, they also come back. It's only with those observed market cycles, I think, that you can really avoid becoming hysterical when markets move. At that point, I think, once a certain portfolio size is reached and a certain level of your own uh, experience with markets, you might be ready to participate in more sophisticated decision making. So let's relook or look back at diversification. You know, we started off with diversification by asset class, the fixed income components and the equity components. But then within each of those, you could diversify by geographic location. Do you want to stay in domestic markets, you know, Canada or North America, or are you willing to invest overseas in, um, you know, Asian markets or um, emerging markets or things of that nature? Beyond that even, 
you'll find different investments by investment style. So growth investment style typically looks for investments that are likely to increase their dividend over time. Whereas value managers are looking for the ones that are, have been beaten up, that are out of favor and their share price might go up um, because you know they're doing things internally to improve their market share. So as you can see, there's lots and lots of different ways to diversify. And again, you need a certain um, magnitude of portfolio to be able to do that. Once you've ensured that you have sufficient diversification by geographic region and all sorts of other you know, value and styles, uh, the next stage is to make sure that you don't have any one particular position that pr comprises too large a proportion of your portfolio. So as a matter of course, I try to coach people to ensure that they don't have any single investment representing more than 10% of their portfolio. Now this could very well be difficult for those who are either um, eligible for stock options or purchasing shares of the company that they work for through their payroll and before you know it you've accumulated a disproportionate amount in a single stock. So uh, there are a few ways to remedy that but that would be you know the, the clear diagnostic tool that there shouldn't be an overrepresentation of any one particular investment. Um, you know, furthermore, when we're looking at either mutual funds or exchange traded funds that are diversified by their very nature, they too should probably also be diversified um, because again, they typically have a mandate. That mandate may be in a particular sector or in a particular geographic region or a particular style of investing. And you again, would like to have a little bit more coverage with regards to the market as a whole. So these are guidelines. Uh, they don't have to be held in stone, but if you have positions that are creeping up close to or exceed one of these two guidelines, you may very well want to start talking to somebody about how to work around them and uh, protect the portfolio as a whole. Once you have your asset allocation put together, then really there's nothing that you can do to influence the uh, the yield on the portfolio. If markets go up, think of it as a rising tide raises all boats. But if markets fall, you better run for the hills because there's nothing you can do to predict it. There's nothing you can do really to, um, to change the outcome. What you can do, and I'm a big proponent of this, is control the fees that you're being charged and the taxes that you're going to pay. So knowing that both fees and taxes erode returns, let's focus on these two issues for a minute. With regards to investment fees, they can be um, charged to you in two different ways, on a transactional basis or on a fee-based basis. Fee -based basis. <laughs> let's talk first about transactional mandates. These are things like commissions uh, to buy and sell or trailer fees, which is a small percentage of um, the account value that is paid to the investment advisor to service the account or management expense ratios, which is the amount that is charged by mutual funds for the regular trading and regulatory, regulatory filings. On the other hand, a fee-based account charges you a set percentage of the assets under management or the portfolio value. And there's pros and cons to each. A transactional mandate is much cheaper in that you only pay to establish the portfolio or to change it. So if you are, you know, your typical buy and hold investor who's not intending to, to change their portfolio much, you're certainly going to pay less by way of a transactional mandate. And that's why people are attracted to things like discount pro brokerages. On the other hand, a fee-based account the fees are predictable. They're typically higher, but they're higher because of uh, a certain mandate that the portfolio will be reviewed periodically and that you should get other services like the service of a person like myself, a financial life strategist, some, um, some advisors who provide fee-based accounts also will do your tax preparation. Typically there are enhancements there. So those are the the things there are advantages to each. Now, there are also disadvantages to each. Transactional mandates, if you're working with an investment advisor, it wasn't uncommon years ago to see investment advisors who would trade frequently or so-called 
churn the account. They'd buy and sell and buy and sell to trigger lots of fees. Thankfully, that's kind of gone the way of the dodo because of a lot of scrutiny. But you, there are rogue advisors who will still do that, and you do want to pay attention to the fees that you're being charged. On the fee-based side, yes, I will admit, fees tend to be higher if you're paying an asset under management fee if there's not a lot of transactions going on in the portfolio. So you certainly want to pick the mandate that works for you. If you're going to be changing the portfolio frequently, you probably want to be in a fee-based um, mandate. But if you're going to be a buy and hold investor and you're not going to be looking for a lot of advice, you know, a transactional mandate might be best for you. Then we want to focus on taxes. So the, the investment returns of a portfolio are divided into three pieces. Your bonds will produce interest. And that interest is fully taxable in exactly the same way as your income from Enbridge is. D um, equity, so stocks and mutual funds that hold them, will what, they won't pay you interest. Their payments are typically in the form of dividends. And those dividends are leniently taxed because before paying them out to you, the company was taxed itself. So to avoid double taxation, the consumer on the receiving end gets what's called a, a pretty elegant dividend gross up and tax credit. Lastly, those same equities, if they are growth equities, will show fluctuations in their share price. And if the share price has gone up, we call that a capital gain. Capital gains also are leniently taxed. Pretty much 50% of the capital gain is what you pay tax on. So as you can see, <clears throat> Interest is not particularly well um, taxed in terms of efficiency, but dividends and capital gains are. So if you can put pieces in the right places, you can protect yourself from the perspective of annual taxation. Interest, again, being the least favorably taxed, you probably want that in an RSP where you're not paying tax on a year-to-year -year basis. You don't get T3s and T5s for money that's invested in your RSP because you're only going to pay tax when you withdraw the money. Whereas money that is tax exposed in what's called a non-registered or cash account, you would want something that pays dividends or capital gains. Again, always start with your asset allocation. You decide what proportion of your portfolio should be in fixed income versus equities, and then place those fixed incomes according to their tax treatment. It's just a special warning for those who might be U.S. citizens. As you may know, the U.S. citizens are, are um, required to pay taxes on their worldwide earnings, or at least report their worldwide earnings. And from an investment perspective, you have to be very careful. The IRS does not really know what to do with a tax-free savings account. They don't recognize it yet. So whatever advantage you get on the Canadian side by way of tax freedom from any uh, taxes payable on investment earnings within a tax-free savings account, you will not find on your American tax return. So be careful of that. Uh, avoid mutual funds offered by Canadian brokerages for similar reasons, and please make sure that you're fully compliant with your tax filings, uh, and you would do that through contacting a cross-border tax specialist. So the keys to investment success. If I were to give away the farm, give you every secret that there is to have about investment success, I would tell you that rebalancing is key. Rebalancing involves knowing the asset allocation that you're willing to participate in, and then rebalancing back to that allocation no matter what the market has done. This promotes market discipline, and it helps you remain objective. It is probably the best example of why it is that investment advisors, or even more so pension administrators, are so much more successful at investing than individuals are, because they remain objective. So that noise is a simulation of the uh, market bell on Wall Street, and it's just we're going to play a fun game here. So let's assume that your portfolio, you're happy with a 40% cash and fixed income investment and 60% equity investment. That's the kind of portfolio that you're happy with. And then markets have shown some strength. They've gone up. 
So without adding a single dollar to the portfolio, because the equities have shown strength, they now are 70% of your portfolio with only 30% being held in cash and fixed income. Now, I'd be willing to wager that most people in this situation would be pretty happy. And what would they do? They may not do anything or they might be tempted to purchase more equities because equities are showing strength. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what you need to be doing. If you're objective and you stick to your original asset allocation, your portfolio is telling you what to do. Your portfolio is telling you we are too high in equities, you must bring it down. Selling those equities will then lock in your gains and effectively sell at a high, which we know, you know, if we had a crystal ball, we would always want to buy low and sell high, which is near impossible. But if you focus on the math in your portfolio, your portfolio is telling you what to do. Lock in those gains and purchase some bonds. But I'm, I, although I'm telling you that this is the way it should be, I will also tell you in a minute, it is incredibly difficult to do. So let's do it again. Again, your portfolio, you're happy with a 40-60 split in favor of equities, but markets have been showing uh, weakness. And all of a sudden, your 60% equity allocation is now only 45%. This is when we're really distraught. Well, what should we do? Well, we know we should be buying into the market, but it's awfully hard to do. Who wants to buy when markets are showing softness? Who was, was a contrarian enough to be buying in 2008? Well, those that did really reaped a ton of rewards because they were able to buy low. And the converse is if you're equity exposure during a, a high market is low, then your bond exposure is probably high. You may not know. Bonds actually trade also. GICs typically don't, but municipal and corporate bonds do trade. And they also produce capital gains and losses. So you can harness even the bond end of it by selling uh, some of your bonds in that at, that at that time and buying into the equity market. But again, it's super hard to do. Sounds simple, incredibly hard to implement, but let the math tell you what the portfolio needs. If you focus and you do this with some regularity, it provides you with the discipline and objectivity that most investors lack. If the portfolio is underweighted in equities relative to where you want to be, ignore all the rest of the noise and buy into what your your desired equity allocation should be. If it's over concentrated in equities, sell even in a high market. Just let the portfolio tell you what it needs. And again, I think this is a tremendous argument for professional inv investment and management. But how often? How often do you rebalance? Well, I would have you start rebalancing annually. And then as the portfolio grows or as you near your goal retirement you may want to increase the frequency you know you may start off with annual rebalancing and then in your peak earning period maybe you want to go to semi-annually or something of that nature and so forth so lastly let's look at how we partner for success suffice it to say that no matter what an investment advisor tells you there really is nothing new under the sun Every advisor is eligible to re get access to the same research, same access to information, and if they are all accredited, they probably have the same knowledge and um, rules of engagement. So you're not going to be looking to one as being able to beat any other. Remember, too, you're only rewarded for your commitment and risk. So what this should tell you is, is that you're not, you shouldn't find an advisor based on what they promise you by way of yield. Find an advisor that is a good fit by way of service. So in other words, do you want to be called constantly when there's a new product available? For example, I don't have a tremendous portfolio myself because I'm still raising a young family, but I do 
um, help my mother with her investment portfolio. And our investment advisor knows that if there's any investment, either a GIC, a bond, or a preferred share that I referred to before, those are the, that hybrid. It's kind of like a bond, but per, but pays you uh, dividends. Anything that exceeds a certain rate of return, and our rate of return that we want is about three and three quarter percent, I want to know about it. So you want to find an advisor who's going to give you that level of service. If you don't want to hear about these things and you just want to be contacted once a year to remind you to make an RSP contribution, terrific. You're going to be off put if that person calls you all the time. So it has to be a good fit on both directions. And secondly, you want to make sure that if you have questions that you feel comfortable asking them and you don't feel intimidated. You don't want to be paying a financial life strategist like myself to answer questions that you should be getting the answers to by your investment advisor. Please, please, please focus on service, not yield. No one can project yield, but service is really important. If you're chasing yield, I can promise you this is going to compromise your judgment. There is no free lunch. If it's too good to be true, it is. And remember that yield is a product of commitment and risk. Now, I love, 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 love this, this uh, graph. This really shows a market cycle and how investors really are their own worst enemies. At the beginning of the cycle, when markets are going up, everybody feels good. You know, you're excited, optimistic, euphoric. And people tend to buy in. But that's really the worst time to be buying in. That's your maximum point of loss. Markets can only go down from there. Exactly when, nobody can predict. Nobody knows when the height of a market is. But we do know when my markets have been good for a long period of time. And it would not be inappropriate for me to tell you that we have seen growth over the last many years, almost nine years now. At that point, you should be cautious. You should start be look, starting to look for ways to defend your portfolio. When markets do t tend to fall, they fall quickly, and it doesn't take long for us to go from anxiety to panic to depression. Depression is the, the low of the market. Again, nobody knows exactly when. And most people are absolutely devastated. That is a terrific entry point. If you can look at your portfolio objectively, as I taught you before, by looking at the math, you will always know when to buy in and when to sell. And you won't let emotions take over because as you can see, emotions tend to tell us to do the exact opposite of what we need to do. One other cautionary note, a lot of people will diversify across financial institutions. So they'll have two advisors and pit them against one another, comparing the yields that they generate. It's not really a fair comparison. And I can tell you this because I don't do this type of thing, but I can tell you objectively, it's not a fair comparison. They both have access to the same products, but they could have this, a different style. One is pursuing, let's say, those beaten up companies. So they might not show a lot of great yields for a lot of years, but then in certain um, environments, they're going to outperform. Similarly, similarly, the ones that are looking to purchase things that will increase their dividend could be showing strength at times when the other one isn't. So it's not actually that one advisor is better than the other so much as that they have different investment styles. But having investments in two places will compromise all of the advice that you get because neither knows what the other is doing, which means you could have a wrong asset allocation. You could be over concentrated in a particular asset. You know, it's not hard to imagine in the early 2000s where two advisors might have both invested in Nortel. And of course, we know where that all went. So I do tend to encourage people not to try to pit advisors against one another, but to find one that they're comfortable with that provides the service that they want and have all of their investments there. So in, by way of summary, remember that investing is like collecting good pieces in a collection or portfolio and that those pieces have to, they have to work together because they will show strengths at different times and ultimately 
work towards your goal. Investors are only rewarded for their commitment, their commitment not to touch the money for a period of time, or the risks that they're willing to take. When you're uh, designing a portfolio, please base it on your target asset allocation, and then with some frequency, with, whether it's annually or semi-annually, rebalance it to take advantage of market fluctuations. That is going to tell you, the portfolio is going to tell you when it needs more equity, when it needs to to cut down on equity, and that might be directly contrary to how you feel about markets, because of course we get caught up in emotion. And lastly, select an advisor based on the service that they're willing to provide and the service that you want, not the yields that they're promising you. Of course, if I can be of any help, again, I'm Monique Madden, I'm the head of Financial Life Strategies at Upotential, and it would be my pleasure to help in any way that I can.